Welcome to the Columbus Metropolitan Club. Today's forum, Let's Go Nuclear, is part of our Fueling Ohio's Future series, which is presented by AEP and Columbia Gas of Ohio, and presented in partnership with OSU's offer, Office of Energy and the Environment. Let's thank our sponsors and partners. Our speakers today on this very important topic represent a wealth of knowledge and experience in this highly technical field. Please welcome Rich Denning, Professor of Nuclear Engineering, Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering, The Ohio State University, and just in from Washington, D.C., Dennis J. Murphy, Vice President of Generation Empower, LLC, our host today is Tom Knox, a reporter for Business First of Columbus, who covers energy and manufacturing. Rich will start us off with an overview of the current state of affairs in the nuclear power industry. Then Tom will take the podium. Rich, the mic is yours. So please join me in welcoming all of our speakers. Take it away. Thank you. I'm actually going to start, and I'm going to talk a little bit about my perspective about what the future of energy supply is in the United States and the world. And then after that, I'm going to give a, a really quick overview of what's happening in to nuclear power, particularly in the United States today. The bad news is that our resources of fossil fuels are finite. At some point, we're going to run out of those fossil fuels. That's unarguable. Clearly, that's going to happen. The real question is, when is that going to happen? And that's uncertain, although the uncertainty in that is not nearly as big as it used to be, because geologists have explored every inch of the world looking for oil and natural gas. Uh, so in order to make some assessment of when that might happen, I look at the EIA, that's the Energy Information Administration of the US government, towards their projections of what our, what our known reserves are of resources worldwide, and then what the projections are. So, and we can also look and say, how much are we consuming today, and then how much are we likely to consume in the near future? And if we use those numbers from the EIA and make projections, basically, the world would run out of oil somewhere between 39 and 83 years in the future, and they'd run out of natural gas somewhere between 42 and 130 years in the future. Well, that doesn't sound too bad, other than the fact that if we run out of oil, then the demand for gas is going to really escalate. Domestically, if we take a purely, we're just going to use domestic resources. We're not going to import oil and natural gas, but also assuming we're not going to export things like natural gas. Based upon our proven reserves, oil would be, uh, would be exhausted in four to 33 years, and gas would be exhausted in 13 to 84 years. Uh, based upon looking at these numbers, I conclude that someplace between 40 and 80 years in the future, we could hit a, a brick wall. We could have a, an energy supply problem that we've never seen before with with implications that are really dramatic. And if we look and see, well, what other things are going to happen in the energy supply area, um, there are some other resources that are being exhausted, not totally exhausted, but which are gonna cost more in the future. The most important of those that I think is fresh water supply. If you look at fresh water supply, we have a major problem. It's not a well-recognized problem in part because it's the problem's largely underground. We're exhausting the reservoirs. If we look at the Ogallala Aquifer, which provides water for irrigation in the Midwest and Southwest, we extract 30% more per year than we replenish. You look around the world, fresh water supply is a really growing problem. There is a solution to that. We can desalinate water. We can pump water, a lot of water around, but it just takes a lot of energy. So 
if you look at what a rational energy policy should be, I think we should plan to replace our fossil resources within, we should re plan to replace 50% of them within 40 years. We should put the infrastructure in place that would, would have things other than oil and natural gas within 40 years. Now, when we look and ask the question, well, how will we do that? That's where the real problem goes. Because if we look at the things that we've traditionally thought of, like, the, uh, like wind and solar, which we've always looked at in terms of electrical power supply, that's not our problem. Electric power supply is only a fraction of our energy supply. Most of our energy that's delivered to do energy services is in the industrial area, and it's not electrical. And, and the second most is in the transportation area. So not only do we have to reply, replace electrical supply, we have the other for, sources that we have to, reply, have, to re, have to supply. And we, when we look at what the, what the sources are that can provide that, nuclear is the only one that can provide the major fraction of that. Now, wind today provides, is starting to provide a significant amount of electrical energy. But wind and solar, we've always looked at within just electrical energy supply. We've recognized because they're variable, they can't provide the base load. They may be able to provide 20 or 30 percent of our electrical energy, but not the base load. But the problem's worse than that. When you look and say, well, how much could we get out of wind? How much could we get out of solar? We see that they really can't provide this massive amount of energy that we have to replace. And I've done some simple calculations that anybody can do. If you look at wind power and say, so in order to provide 50%, say 50% of our energy with wind power, we would have to increase our amount of windmills by a factor of 70. We'd have to do it in 40 years. It would take two and a half times our annual production of stainless steel to do that. So we just physically couldn't do it if there was really that room for that many windmills, if we were willing to accept that many more bats and birds being killed and the, and the issues. I don't mean to badmouth windmills because they are going to be, they are today and they will be a major supply. And if we look at solar, it's farther behind. It's significantly more expensive. If we put solar panels on every housetop in the United States, not that it would make sense to do that, 400 square foot of solar panels on every house in the United States, ignore the fact that some places like Columbus are cloudy a good deal of the time, you could produce only 5% of our total delivered energy. So these are gonna be very important. If we look at energy supply, energy supply in the future, we have to have an all of the above uh, approach towards that but nuclear has to be a major supply. There are other things we can talk about. I won't get into those now because I, I want to move on to now what's the status of nuclear energy today. So in the United States, we have 100 operating nuclear power plants. They're aging, but almost all of those are going through plant life extensions from 40 to 60 years. That shouldn't be a concern to you. Almost everything in a nuclear power plant, almost everything is, is replaceable and maintainable. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> we have four nuclear power plants that are under construction of a new design. So, so the hope for the future for the nuclear industry are what we call generation three plus reactors. They are light water reactors that are safer than the existing reactors in that they're passively safe. So they really don't require AC power. They really don't require human intervention. Four of those are under construction in the south. All four of those are designed by Westinghouse AP1000s. Those AP1000s are also four of them being built in China. China's also committed to eight more of those. AP1000s are, have a good opportunity to be around the world. And if we look around the world other than the United States, we see major, major steps forward in almost all countries towards expanding nuclear energy. In the United States, things are not nearly that good. We have also 13 other licenses under review by the NRC, but they're moving nowhere. And the reason they're moving nowhere, there are lots of reasons for that, and hopefully we'll get some questions about that. 
uh, uh, and what the barriers are to really the expansion. But what's going to happen is we're going to see the amount of nuclear produced electricity decrease before it increases again. Um, the other thing that's on the horizon here is modular reactors. And I'm not going to say much about those because this is Dennis's area. There are four vendors that are designing reactors that are smaller than 300 megawatts electrical. They would be provided in groups, pairs, or multiples. Um, and there's some advantages to those. The Department of Energy has just, or a year ago, issued uh, some supporting funds for BMW for the Empower, and more recently for New Scale, another one of those of those four. And that's all I'm going to say uh, right now. And hopefully, we'll get a chance to identify some of the real issues in the rest of the talks. All right. Thank you, Rich. Um, again, I'm Tom Knox. I'm energy manufacturing reporter at Columbus Business First. Um, Thanks to the Metro Club for having me here today. I was originally going to cover this, and they asked me to moderate, so it's a pretty good bump for me. <laughs> um, you know, I've, I'm pretty new at Columbus Business First. Um, I've caught up on oil and gas drilling and, and deregulation and, and, and electricity market, but uh, I must admit I'm a, I'm a novice when it comes to nuclear engineer or nuclear en energy. So uh, let's just get straight to the questions. Um, there's a lot of it potential impact for Ohio and nationwide with nuclear engineering. And we have two very smart people here to uh, tell us about it. So first, I'll uh, give Rich a bit of a, 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 a break and ask uh, Dennis, you know, modular reactors, thorium, uh, Empower, there's all these sort of alternative uh, uses uh, for, for nuclear engineering. I mean, what is the future of those and are those options better than the larger plants that we currently have uh, in the United States? Okay. Uh, first of all, thanks uh, for having me here today. It's nice to be back um, in the Buckeye State. I'm, I'm from originally from Youngstown, Ohio, um, so I was probably one of the only people in the state of Georgia disappointed two weeks ago. Uh, one of my best friends called me to give me uh, some heat about that, and unfortunately he was a Syracuse graduate, so uh, a couple days later I made a phone call. So it, it is nice to be back here and, and also to talk a little bit about, uh, about energy uh, in what's really my home state. Uh, one of the first things I would want to make sure you understand when you talk about small modular reactors uh, is this is not a big versus small discussion as it regards nuclear technology. I think it was John F. Kennedy that said uh, a high tide rises all the boats. So the bottom line is when we talk about small modular reactors, they are not necessarily intended to replace big ones. I think as what we call the gigawatt class reactors uh, succeed, uh, and there's one uh, under construction right now in Georgia, Plant Vogel. Uh, they will also help uh, the introduction of small modular reactors. Conversely, as small modular reactors begin to come onto the landscape, I think those will help um, with uh, the greater acceptance and even more construction of, of the bigger nuclear power plants. In terms of their um, feasibility, or, or exactly, you know, to your question, you know, why are these things good? Uh, you know, how will they fit into the energy equation? Uh, I think you know one of the most important things to understand is that uh, you don't want to ever group small modular reactors together. There are all sorts of different kinds, and some you made reference to the thorium reactors. There are some that are uh, as many as three to four decades out, uh, and there are ones like the Empower reactor, which, uh, if all goes well, we are looking at deployment in a 2022 time frame. And, and the reason for that uh, is that it uses proven nuclear technology that we already use. The Empower reactor, for instance, uh, is an advanced light water reactor. It's, it's a PWR. So we, we know that technology. So one of the things we're very pleased about is as we uh, begin to approach the licensing phase, uh, which will apply for a design certification application uh, in early 2015, uh, the NRC will not have to introduce any new regulations to approve a small modular reactor. If they were to do that, that would make the process it conceivably, you know, take, take 10 more years just to license it. Uh, the other thing that we, we like about them, in addition to being proven, uh, is they are safer. This does not mean the big ones are unsafe, uh, but there are some technological deployments. There are some uh, 
uh, geographical considerations, the fact that these are underground, for instance. Uh, there are some implications regarding how much security you need, uh, how well they can be uh, managed, things like, you know, there's a passive safety system, so if something were to ever happen, you could literally leave that plant and gravity will take care of the cooling, so, so you won't have any uh, operators need to do anything. Uh, they're also flexible in that flow modular reactors can do something that's called load following, which means as the uh, power plant operators want to have more or less load, a modular reactor can uh, go up or down uh, in the range of 10% uh, per minute. Uh, and then finally, and then I'll, I'll turn it back to you, you know, we see these as extremely affordable. Uh, now, when I say affordable, we're talking 1.8 to 2.2 billion dollars for 3.6 360 megawatts of electricity, you say that sounds a lot, but a gigawatt class is going to be between 20 and 22 billion dollars. So there are utilities that literally, if for instance their market cap is 20 billion dollars, they are literally betting the whole company on whether a gigawatt class plant would succeed or fail. You talk about companies like Southern Company, one of the largest utilities in, in, in the country, they can place that bet. You know, they have a little bit more uh, uh, money to work with. But, but these are a little bit more uh, bite-sized in terms of the investment. Uh, you can recoup your investment a little bit sooner. So we, we see them as safer, proven, affordable, uh, and practical options as a way to introduce uh, uh, nuclear technology into the grid system. I guess the last thing I would say is something we are also pleased about is you can, uh, because of the geographic size of these, these could uh, fit into where you might be retiring coal plants, for instance. So they take about 40 acres of land uh, to put one of those in. So it, it's a long answer to your question, but I hope it covered a lot of the areas you were looking for. Yeah, let, let me add a couple of things in it. So, so, uh, Basically, what you've heard about is an extension of the light water reactor technology that we currently have. Uh, but nuclear power plants can also be used for process heat applications. And as I indicated, there really is a tremendous demand as we replace the, uh, the gas and oil for process heat applications. So, so there are designs that are typically small modular designs, but not light water de designs. They are higher temperature. They also typically are higher efficiency. There also are designs that could extend our resources of uranium further. So the kinds of reactors we've been talking about here mostly are what we call burner reactors. Uh, eventually, if we really had to provide the kinds of energy I talked about before, we would have to have the equivalent of 1,000 plants. We have 100 now. We'd have to have the equivalent of 1,000. The equivalent, they might be m smaller reactors, but the equivalent of 1,000 large reactors, many of them would be of different types. We would pretty quickly ex get rid of, uh, run out of uranium if we used the kinds of tools we do today. That's why we talk about breeder reactors and we talk about thorium-based reactors as alternatives. Uh, moving back to traditional plants, uh, some countries in Europe have sworn off uh, nuclear power plants uh, because of Fukushima, at least for the time being. What about uh, nationwide? I mean, what are the prospects of new plants uh, since, since uh, the meltdowns there? Let, let me take the first step of that. So first of all, as we look at the effect of Fukushima on public opinion, it surprisingly hasn't really changed public opinion in the United States very much, nor worldwide. As we look worldwide, we see a couple of countries. The most notable are Germany and Belgium and maybe Italy to an extent, uh, but certainly the biggest is, is Germany that said, we're going to move out of nuclear power, and it's very short-sighted uh, on their part, in my humble opinion. But what we're seeing otherwise worldwide is a tremendous interest and growth in the use of nuclear energy. Almost every small country, as well as large country, country is now has discussions and plans for nuclear power plants because they see what's coming down the line. They see the problems of energy independence and the control, for example, of Russia over gas supplies and things like that. They're all looking, and I think that in the small modular reactor area, a lot of those countries would find small modular reactors extremely attractive. 
Uh, to that point, a couple areas that we're seeing a lot of interest in, not surprisingly, uh, is China uh, has a, a significant amount of interest in small modular reactors, simply because uh, you, you want to try to get the power out to the provinces, and, and those are extremely far away from water supplies, which are typically needed to power uh, or to, to cool large, large plants. Uh, the United Kingdom uh, is very interested in them, and then even uh, countries like Indonesia, which is you know populated by just hundreds and hundreds of islands, uh, are, are very interested in the technology. I guess the other thing I would add um, about Fukushima is I just returned back from the regulatory information conference in Washington, D.C., where the head of the NRC made an interesting point in saying that we read many times that the Fukushima accident was uh, unfathomable, inconceivable, you know, one it just could, it just chance it could have happened was just incredibly remote. But he said when, when they really dug into the walk down of what happened, the reality was it, it wasn't, that, that there were some mistakes made with design, uh, certainly things that they could change, but they said the, the idea that, um, that, that this was simply uh, in not preventable uh, by their position is they, they don't buy it anymore. Uh, and they said, you know, the good thing about that is they really learned some hard lessons that they would have rather not learned that way. Uh, but they said it certainly ha has upped the bar in terms of saying now we know what other things we've got to be careful of. Simply going back sometimes as far there as 100 years and looking what was happening at the water tables. Uh, they, they said if they would, would have gone back just an extra 100 years, they probably could have seen that that was much more um, uh, realistic than, than it turned out to be. That is the size of the tsunami, actually. So, so if you look at at the frequency of events that are acceptable in the design of nuclear power plant, they're on the or order of big events once every 10,000 years. And, and what, uh, amazingly, the Japanese who have all this experience with seismic uh, didn't do was they did not design the plant sufficiently for tsunamis that had occurred well within the hundreds of years time frame. So, so there, it was a major uh, design error to start off with, and then there were other design errors and response errors that compounded it. Uh, Rich, you alluded to new volumes of uh, cheap natural gas in your opening. Um, you know, in Ohio, we have the burgeoning uh, Eastern Ohio shale play. Uh, how or does the availability, availability of all that gas affect the future of, of nuclear power plants? Well, I, I think there's a, sh a short-term effect that, I think that I'd like to discuss. In the long term, clearly what it does is it gives us time. Uh, it, we really need time to make the transition to the world where we don't have those resources. And I recognize that we use oil and natural gas for lots of other important things like plastics and fertilizer and stuff like that. And imagining a world without plastic is kind of inconceivable. Um, but as we look uh, at the short term, there really has been a major impact. Because we live in a, in, at least in, in the northern part of uh, the United States, in deregulated society, uh, as far as electricity is concerned, and a utility cannot do anything other than buy natural gas now. I mean, as far as expanding their, their power, um, that's the only thing that they could do. Gas is so cheap today that um, that's the only sensible thing. And that's hurting nuclear power plants, even to the point where some nuclear power plants are shutting down that are a major natural, national resource. Um, they're shutting down just because the short-term economic environment is such that, that that's the only thing utilities can do. Dennis, you want to add anything? Or? I, I think that the point on natural gas is, is exactly right. That's, that's actually created an environment where it, it's incredibly unfortunate that perfectly, safely, uh, efficiently operating nuclear plants uh, are, are being shut down. Uh, simply as a matter of economics, and whether you call it short-sighted or not, the, the reality is, and, and I think everybody in this room knows, that natural gas f prices are notoriously, notoriously volatile. And yes, big discoveries of shale gas uh, have, have driven those down even further, but you live in an environment, I've been in the energy industry 25 years, um, and I, so I know what those prices do, and I know what they will do. The, the history just tells me they won't possibly stay this low. Do I know when they'll change? Of course not. But, but the reality is um, it's, it's a great fuel. You need it. 
Um, and thank goodness we have it, but you, you definitely don't want to get in a world where you're placing all your bets there. When I was with EPRI, we used to talk about there's no silver bullet. You need a, just like you need an investment portfolio, you need an energy portfolio that has a little bit of everything. Uh, and I think uh, uh, that's where it's unfortunate when you see uh, extremely good facilities being shut down uh, simply on economics, but that's a reality and, and I get it. The federal EPA is, is causing some utilities, including AEP, to, to shut down their coal plants um, because of new requirements. Uh, does that change in capacity help uh, nuclear gain steam, or, or, or are there other barriers to uh, coming online? I would say it, it certainly won't hurt, but there are a lot more things that you have to take into consideration because there, there will always be uh, additional options, I think. The, uh, the big challenge is, is simply, again, it, it's an economics. It, it is a longer-term play. Uh, so they, whatever you, whenever you decide to put one in, you, you won't have it tomorrow. So, so a lot of people have to look that out, and I'm sure Rich has some thoughts on that as well. Well, I, th I think coal is a real question as to what we ought to be doing with coal, I mean, I think that uh, it is it is a real resource for us as far as hydrocarbons are concerned. And I, my own feeling about the future is, even though I strongly believe that that uh, there is a global warming issue, I don't think that we will ever get the world together to have a real policy that that protects us there. But I do think that coal is something that could in the long term be a feedstock that we use, that we preserve as a feedstock for, uh, for these other uses that we have for plastics, for fertilizers, and things like that, rather than burning it and, 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 ha and undergoing the, the, the greater impact on, the glo on, the, uh, on CO2 and greenhouse gas, that we ought to really preserving, be preserving our coal supplies as a feedstock material. You mentioned earlier that there are some new plants coming online or that have been okayed. Yes. Are those different than the ones that are existing now? Yes, yes. So, and, and it's really important, and I think Dennis Im implied this also. So, so one of the things, it, if we're really going to be able to build in the nuclear energy that I see that's ne needed, then then it's going to take some time to get through the licensing hurdles and stuff like that. So even if it's only four plants that are currently under construction, that's really critical. Getting that experience with those is really critical towards, towards, um, towards uh, removing some of the concerns that people that loan money have and, and, and the rates that they would charge for new nuclear power plants. Um, uh, and, and shortening the time for construction and licensing of plants. So, so the fact that we have these four plants under construction going through that is really, really important and, uh, and I think provides the stage on which we can then move forward much more aggressively towards, uh, towards filling the, what I see as a deficiency of alternatives to natural gas and oil. Dennis, you want Add to that. You know, I, I think that that's a, a great point. One of the other uh, implications of uh, putting in more nuclear, though, is it does put a lot of stress on the transmission system. Uh, you can't simply drop one in and let it be powered by, you know, substations that used to basically come out of a coal plant. So one of the things that makes uh, small modular reactors, for instance, a little bit more appealing, you can use the same distributions and transmission systems because you're still only trying to push through somewhere in the neighborhood of 360 megawatts as opposed to a gigawatt of power. And uh, as, as the people from AEP know, I'm sure, uh, you know, our transmission system is, is significantly pressed um, in, in a lot of places. Uh, and that certainly, uh, those kind of reactors reduce that challenge. Um, you know, talking about coal plants uh, being, being decommissioned, you know, there's still far more energy produced by coal than nuclear. What are the economics? Uh, how comparable are they to, to, to coal? I mean, you mentioned how long it takes for them to get built, Dennis, but I mean, what are the economics? Let me take a first crack at that. So National Academy of Study Sciences has done a study of what the economics are of all the alternatives and looking at what America's energy future could be. And basically, they see um, nuclear, future nuclear in the area of six to eight cents per kilowatt hour. That, that is with loan guarantees. And, and my little bring up loan guarantees because 
it is a question, is that a subsidy or what are, what are loan guarantees? So loan guarantees are particularly important for nuclear power plants because, because people that lend money don't take risk. And people that lend money for nuclear power plants are concerned about what happened in the United States back at the Three Mile Island time when, when there were, uh, when the, the, the time to build plants was extended and stuff like that. So, so uh, but in any event, uh, with, with the loan guarantees and paying off the price of the loan guarantees, six to eight cents, which makes them competitive, not with natural gas today, uh, close to competitive with coal without carbon capture. Coal with carbon capture would be very expensive, or coal with some sort of a carbon tax, then nuclear is be clearly better. Right now, without carbon capture, coal would be less expensive, but slightly. Uh, you, there's, and, and you look at wind, it, there, is a, there is a, we do subsidize wind a small amount, but wind is very close. I mean, wind in good areas is very close to being cost competitive. Nothing today is competitive with natural gas, though, if you're looking for new energy at $6 per whatever it is. I can't remember the units. Now, his, his numbers are dead on with what I would, would, uh, would quote you as well. Um, one of the things that also that we haven't talked much about, and uh, you know, I've, I've loved renewables uh, as much as any other energy source, but the reality on those, intermittency is an issue. Um, you know, unfortunately, the sun shines and the wind blows uh, whenever it does. So when, when uh, the clouds come out, you lose your energy on solar. When the wind stops, you, as you know about Texas, the grid can sometimes shut down. And there's a lot of evidence that shows, unfortunately, especially on the wind side, it tends to be at its peak when energy usage is at its lowest. So, so they are not, uh, you know, the, uh, the ultimate solution. The other thing with that is then, therefore, typically you need some type of backup system, which is typically in the form of gas, so that when those turbines do stop uh, turning or the sun stops shining, that you have something to, to create that power. So, uh, so the, the implications of renewables are not simply a does it make economic sense or reliability, uh, intermittency is a challenge. Okay. I um, just want to remind people that in a couple minutes um, we'll start taking audience questions. So I have a question or two left for, for you guys from me. Um, you know, as a business reporter, I'm interested in the commercial opportunities for businesses in Ohio related to uh, nuclear in, to en energy. I mean, what are the sort of uh, ancillary operations that could come from companies in Ohio that are trying to uh, work with this, this industry? Go ahead. Sure. Well, well, one of the things as we look at small modular reactors, we see, um, we see lots of factory fabrication of, of things, lots of subcontractors in those areas. I'm not a specialist on all of the um, activities that are already performed within the state of Ohio in support of nuclear power, but there is a large amount. And um, a lot of it's in the Cleveland area. I'm trying to remember the specific companies, but, but there certainly is that. We also, we, we never really talked about Piketon and, and that area there, which is an area that, that does have significant potential, has some nuclear facilities there, has an enrichment facility, has some facilities that are being shut down. Uh, there's an op there are opportunities there for the placement of a nuclear power plant there, um, lots of potential jobs uh, in that area, which is a fairly depressed area uh, of Ohio. And as you're probably aware, Babcock and Wilcox, our parent company, uh, is located in Barberton, Ohio. They do a great deal of work there as well as in Euclid. So. <laughs> Uh, so it is nice. There's actually some very concrete work that's taken place uh, in the state of Ohio relating to nuclear energy as a whole uh, and, and SMR specifically. Before we get to, to audience questions, um, related sort of over this whole topic is the safety of, of nuclear power plants. Just how safe are they compared to every other type of plant there is? No, I mean, this is, this is really my area of what I do is I, I my specialty is risk assessment. And from a safety viewpoint, nuclear power plants are extremely safe. Now, people will say, oh, I can't believe this. But it's the safest form, as far as human health is concerned, the safest form of producing a given amount of energy. Uh, if you look at Fukushima, which was a tremendous accident, 
there is no member of the public that received a significant dose of radiation that would increase their probability of getting cancer. Melted down three reactors, had very large release, had a huge economic impact. People have misunderstood and we've mischaracterized what the real risk of nuclear power plant accidents is. If you live right next door to a nuclear power plant, you don't have to worry a bit about the safety of that nuclear power plant. The risk is extremely small. The risk of nuclear power plants is what we saw at Fukushima, which was the potential for land contamination, the potential that you're gonna have to move away from your home, that you may not be even able to ever move back, the expense of having to decontaminate. It's, it's that, that risk, that societal risk, that's the real risk of nuclear power plants. That's why Belgium's decided not to have do nuclear power plants, because they say, well, gee, if I contaminated Belgium, what happens? You know, where do we go? You know, so that's, no, the reality is that that risk is a manageable risk, and that risk is not really a large risk in comparison with other societal risks that we face all the time. But, but that's the risk, that's, that's the real concern, and that's where we're seeing a lot of focus now that we didn't see before in assuring not only protection of the public, but protection of making sure we don't have a big release of radioactive material that would lead to that kind of societal cost of cleanup. Uh, you know, one of the things that I hear a lot of people say is that nuclear industry is, tends to be one that apologizes for things it never did. Uh, and one of the reasons for that is there is an extremely uh, talented group of people who market against nuclear energy. Uh, there, uh, if, if one movie I would recommend uh, if you want to see uh, something that, that I think has some very credible information on the, uh, the safety of nuclear power is called Pandora's Promise. I don't know if any of you have seen that, but, but it's an exceptional movie, and one of the things that makes it interesting, it, it is uh, primarily uh, the issues are addressed by scientists who formerly were opponents of nuclear energy and, and are now in favor of it. There, at the RIC conference I spoke of a minute, a little while ago, there were uh, discussions about people, there are YouTube videos of people on, you know, on the coast of the U.S. with Geiger counters in the water saying, look, the radiation's already here, and the reality was none of that was true, but it made some for uh, some incredibly startling um, television, for sure. And uh, like I say, the uh, I wish they weren't as good at that as they are sometimes, but 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 they're passionate, they're talented, and and they tell a pretty good story that we've got to often uh, do the best we can to to make sure people understand is not accurate. All right. Well, it is uh, CMC's tradition to take audience questions, so if you have any questions you want to ask Richard Dennis, uh, go into the middle of the room and um, state your name and ask your question. We do always ask that you avoid long and editorial comments. Um, so it looks like we have a first question here coming up. Hi, uh, Andy Campbell. Thank you for being here today, gentlemen. Uh, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the, the fuel supply for nuclear power. I understand that there is also, like coal, a limited amount of uranium on the planet as well as maybe how we handle the disposal of the spent uranium. But then part two is we've been hearing, if you're looking into this, a little bit about thorium reactors, and I'd like to know more about how that might be used and its availability. Well, well let me take it first. What I, one I thing I think we also, <laughs> we, we, we perhaps should focus on is waste disposal, because that's one of the things that people really worry about. They say, how can we have more nuclear power plants when we don't know how to dispose of the waste? And the reality is we do know how to dispose of the waste. If we look at Yucca Mountain, the one that was stopped, it was stopped for purely political reasons. There was, there, I, I've been deeply involved in the review of the uh, safety analysis that were done for that site. But I'm not totally unhappy by the fact that Yucca Mountain was, was stopped. And the reason is that the fuel that we would put, spent used fuel that we would put in Yucca Mountain is fuel that really has a lot more energy potential still in it. And we know ways to, to do that better. So I think that really we ought to be completely rethinking how we handle that, but, but we really ought to be taking that used fuel. We should be reprocessing it. We should be putting it back in the reactors and burning up the stuff that's really the long-lived stuff that makes people worry about, about about tens of thousands of years or stuff like that. Um, 
did you want to make some comments no, on some I, other I, things? And you probably know this number better than I do, Rich, but I know that you know, the, typically a fuel rod has, uh, I, th I think I've heard uh, sometimes only about 18 to 19 percent of its energy expended before it's taken out of the reactor, that that much is, uh, so there's still that much energy in what we would call waste. Yeah, but, but the way we use fuel now, if we have another generation of light water reactors, uh, we'll start to really strain that, that uranium resource and we'll have to use, move to, to breeding reactors, which is, is, uh, extends the fuel uranium supply by about a factor of 100. And also at, at, for the thorium reactors, which have a, quite a different fuel cycle. Uh, and there are various countries, particularly India, that are looking heavily at thorium. And there's a, and there's a group of real strong thorium promoters in, in the United States today, and, and they've got some, some pretty good ideas, but it is, does dramatically extend the, the supply of thorium and uranium for fission-based um, energy production. As a university professor, retired a long time ago, I really have my hats off to the people who are doing all the research to try to make nuclear more feasible affordable and safer. But I have a couple of questions about the safety. That's what my biggest concern is. And you've talked about some of them. Uh, one is, uh, apparently the insurance companies won't insure. It has to be the government to cover the liability, to give you liability protection, or we wouldn't have an industry. Uh, and that may be, if that's wrong, I want to know it. Uh, what is the ha average half-life of the uh, spent fuel from the new reactors? That's another question. And this is the one that worries me the most. How well guarded is the spent fuel at more than 100 sites in the United States? What's the risk of somebody not worrying about their health or their life getting this material and making dirty bombs, which would make a large area uninhabitable for a century or more. But let's get into those as much as we can get them re in reverse order. As far as spent fuel being well protected, it's extremely well protected. It's hard to get at, and it's extremely safe in, in, these, in these containers. And if you tried, as a terrorist, to try to get that fuel out of there, <laughs> you would be in a world of hurt. I mean, it would be extremely difficult to do. Dirty bombs. That's not the way to do, to do dirty bombs. Dirty bombs, you do stealing medical things, medical sources and stuff like that, and dirty bombs are not a big threat to health and stuff like that. So that was, uh, let's see, what were the, uh, so, so as far as the, as far as the new nuclear power plants that we're talking about right now, the radioactive material that comes out of them looks essentially like the radioactive material that comes out of light water reactors today. That's. That's not changing. It's what we do with it after it comes out and how we reprocess it. And I'm um, trying to remember there was a third. Insurance. Oh, insurance. So, so there are two different elements here. So insurance is, it's true that there is, are limits to the liability that people have. And so what happens if you have a big accident, and I'm going to forget the exact numbers now, all of the utilities, regardless of whether it was at their utility or not, they contribute a large amount of money to, to provide for whoever has claims against that, okay? Eventually, above some ceiling, then the government takes over the liability. Individually, um, the, uh, the utilities don't really have liability in terms of, of um, beyond that, above this, certain, this level. Can you remember where those no, amounts I are? No, but, I don't. Yeah, but, but anyway, that, that's, that's where the how liability is covered. Thank you for your answers. Hello. I am an ex-Navy wife, so it was 10 years in nuclear power, so I am a proponent for nuclear power. Uh, after 10 years in the Navy, he went up to Midland, Michigan, and it was a nuclear power plant to start. There is one person that was a true advocate to not have nuclear power. So I used to always say to him, why do you not have more publicity? Why are we not teaching about nuclear power in schools? Why are we not doing better education to educate people about nuclear power? 
I, I guess I could take a first shot at that. You know, the, the short answer is we, we do uh, uh, Generation Empower and B&W, and I think a lot of other companies actually do go out and, and speak to this when we're asked. Unfortunately, um, we're not asked as much as I wish we were. Uh, and, and the reality is, and, and when I was at, uh, I'll never forget when I was at GE when we purchased Enron's wind business and suddenly my phone exploded with calls from Rolling Stone magazine and p people that never called us to basically say we want to talk about wind. No one wanted to talk uh, at all about the nuclear uh, uh, energy side of the business. And when I asked a couple of the editors, he said, well, the, the, he said, I don't want to be, um, you know, critical of my own people, but he said my science editors don't understand it very well, so they don't write about it very often. And he said, you know, he called it a deterioration of the scientific mind in the journalism field. Uh, and he said that trickles into the educational system is what his concern was. So I think, I think we, we are available to do it as much as we're asked to. We can't force it, un unfortunately, in there. And, and by the way, if there's any more information, you, you know, generationempower.com, if you want more information on this to get to the school children, uh, it's very easy to do that. But, but we even tried some things, some tactics of, of putting together uh, parts of our websites, both at GE and at the Electric Power Research Institute, where I used to be basically for teachers. And it was, and I, and I wouldn't say it was a failure, but it certainly what it wasn't as, as successful as I wish it would have been. So, so part of the onus, I think, falls on, on somebody has to convince the schools uh, and then, I think, uh, give them the resources to, to support that. Uh, but, it, but it's an area where, you know, we just can't basically go in where we're not wanted, I guess. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for being here. I'm Jane Scott. Um, just curious of your perspectives on um, what it might take or, or what's going to motivate um, a comprehensive energy policy for this country, besides a miracle. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, that, that certainly is the scary part because it's, it's so, it's kind of like global warming where you can't really see what's happening. People don't really understand what's happening. and, and uh, so it certainly takes a public that's become aware of the problem and how we make the public aware of the problem. I just don't know because, I, I mean, our Department of Energy has no energy policy. How can that be? How can they, I mean, it, it just is um, incredible to me. But nobody wants to hear a, a bad story. There's no politician that wants to hear there's a crisis. Um, you know, it, it just is hard to get people's attention, and it's hard to even get their, I mean, I mean it's, it, it's really nice to talk to audiences like you because you have people that are educated, understand issues, and this type of thing. But you recognize that, that half the people in the United States don't really know whether the Earth goes around the sun or the sun goes around the Earth. You know, I mean, it, it's, it's, it really is... Is a, is a problem. There's a lot of distrust of science, and how we how we regain that trust or how how we educate is is really a difficult problem. Yeah, yeah I would add. You know, one of the challenges is that energy challenges uh, vary significantly by regions of the country. So there's no one size fits all, unfortunately. So the idea of renewable mandates or, well, say you have to do this, it, it doesn't apply region to region, which means the formulation of a policy is extremely difficult. And we don't tend to gravitate towards solutions that are difficult, unfortunately. Okay, we have time for two more questions, so go ahead, uh, sir. My name is John McKnight. And um, so you say that nuclear energy is you know, among the safest or the safest energy to produce. Airplanes are the safest way to travel. Planes still crash. To say that nuclear energy is the safest to produce doesn't put my mind at ease that, uh, that we're not likely to face you know, catastrophic events in the future related to this. So is the technology actually allowing us to produce this type of energy in a safer manner, or is the technology simply building a bigger wall around it to, you know, to kind of contain the, the catastrophe when it does happen? Well. Thank you. Yeah, no, I mean, it's a good question because, you know, we can't come up here and say you're never going to have another accident that looks like Fukushima. It's conceivable that you could. There's the reasons why Fukushima shouldn't have happened. Uh, if we look at the next generation of reactors, they are passively safe. There, there is an, an element of inherent safety that's that's better in them. But I don't want you to think that 
that that means that you couldn't have a meteor smash into a nuclear power plant um, of a passively safe design and have some major release. But the reality is that we face risks in everything we do, and and you're not going to see an and and the potential for an accident that where you have people with big exposures of radiation and stuff like that. I just don't see that. I mean, we, we analyze the, the 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 kind of accident that occurred at Fukushima is the most analyzed accident we have. Not not due to not due to that particular initiator that really caused it, but we have analyzed those things since since the early 80s with with uh, methods. And if you're thinking about that, gee, there's something really really catastrophic beyond what you see at Fukushima. There it isn't there. That's not going to happen. You could see Fukushima kind of accident. You could see people with higher doses that they had at Fukushima, but almost impossible that you'd see doses that where people would die from radiation sickness. Almost impossible. I'm the ex-Navy nuke. <laughs> <laughs> Just, um, OK, I spent 10 years in the Navy. We have operated nuclear reactors safely for over 50 years. Hundreds of them, thousands of operators, people don't get that, all right? And most of the operators in the power plants are ex-Navy nukes, all right? So I spent a few years at Consumers Power Company when I got out, uh, the Midland plant. The 350 million seven year project that 17 years later, $4.3 billion shut down, right? Because it happened during Three Mile Island, right? And so they kept changing the safety requirements and had to pull out systems, put new systems in. One of the things I saw that the Navy did was they would design a reactor plant and all the engine room that went along, <clears throat> excuse me, a little bit nervous, uh, went along with it. And then they got it up and operating safely, trained reactor operators, engine room operators on that, and would build 10 nuclear submarines, five aircraft carriers, right? One of the problems I saw in the commercial nuclear world is it seemed like we were forever reinventing the wheel, okay? And you'd end up with 30 engineering firms and 25 construction companies, which all complicates it. Have we gotten to a point where you build it, you, you make a design, and then you boom, 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 build 10 plants? On the SMR side, that's certainly exactly the vision. The control rooms, plant by plant, would be identical. The uh, INC instrumentation and control would be identical. These are integral reactors, so they're factory built, they're put on rail cars. Uh, and in fact, the plant design, we're gravitating toward a plant design that is uniform as well. So that if you're trained on one, you would basically be able to go, just like a new naval reactor. Uh, I, I think your point on, on the lessons of the past is exactly right, though, is we build one and we learn and then we build another completely different one. And so this idea of uniformity uh, in manufacturing standards, everything else is, is critical, I think, for the future success of the industry, because you're exactly right. The Navy nailed it. They know exactly how to do it and have done it for decades. We encourage you to continue the conversation in the lobby over coffee and cookies. And once more, let's thank our sponsors, AEP and Columbia Gas of Ohio, and our partner, the OSU Office of Energy and Environment. Let's also thank our speakers, Rich Denning, Dennis J. Murphy, and Tom Knox, and thank you for being here.